I think there's uh, something in us as people, we are wired in a way that um, we think that if God is real, like the God we believe in is real, and we do, uh, and we feel like we're trying hard to be faithful, that that'll be proved out by seeing kind of big, dynamic, powerful uh, acts of God. Uh, We kind of have that instinct that, uh, man, if I'm walking with the Lord and He's the one true God, that that'll be proved by seeing big things happen. Some congregations or some uh, denominations more than others uh, constantly look for uh, big power encounters, right? Like big miracles or uh, like an extraordinarily uh, powerful spiritual gift. And that will be the evidence that they're looking for to say that our God is real and he loves me, and he's at work in my life. And that shows up in some uh, denominations more than others. But the reality is that really all of us as Christians, we tend to define where God is at work, or maybe where he isn't at work, by uh, numbers, by productivity, by examining our lives and, and trying to figure out, are big things happening? Are big personal dynamic things happening in my life or through my life? And we tend to kind of measure if God is in this based on these displays of of power, these big things. And oftentimes over the years, I've I've just talked with so many people and this, you know, I'm I'm, uh, human like this too. What that often leads to is our lives can feel small at times. And we can look around and we can say, man, there's not really any big dynamic thing happening around me or in me. And we can start to ask, you know, really, um, you know, really uh, damaging questions like, why, why isn't God with me? Why isn't he doing more in my life? Uh, am I not praying enough? Right? Am I not exercising faith or the right kind of faith. Like, what, what am I not doing that is keeping God from doing the big things that prove that, that He's at work, He's real? And I think we tend to ask that question quite a bit too. If you've ever struggled with that, then the passage we're going to study uh, has a real encouragement for you this morning. It's the passage that Tom just read. It's Zechariah chapter 4. And the angel visits Zechariah again uh, through another vision. Uh, look, at, look at verse 1. It says, And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me, like a man who is awakened out of his sleep. I mentioned a few weeks ago that these visions, uh, they are not stressing the idea that Zechariah is actually asleep. Uh, In fact, that phrase here, like a man awakened out of his sleep, uh, would not actually not be needed. It wouldn't make sense if Zechariah was actually asleep. The idea, the main point is that God is specifically coming to Zechariah with a vision, like with a light, with clarity. And it's in a time where the people around Zechariah are, are really living in darkness in those areas. Like they lack vision. They lack clarity. They lack trust in God. And so that's the idea behind these visions is that God is giving Zechariah clarity, vision, light. Now listen to the vision. This shows up in verses 2 and 3. And he said to me, uh, what do you see? I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold, with a bowl on the top of it and seven lamps on it with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. So uh, a lampstand, another word for that that many of you have heard is menorah. A lampstand is is simply that. It's, It's a gold stand on which you'd place a a lamp, and then you'd place the bowl of oil that would supply the lamp. And this lampstand actually has seven lamps on it. So if you picture like 
a single lamp, but with seven branches off of it. Each one has a wick. And the point is, with the image here, the point is that's a lot of light. Like this is a picture of the superlative light. Like this is a very bright lampstand. And beside the lamp is an olive tree, actually two of them, one on either side. And so uh, if you're wondering what those mean, so is Zechariah. Uh, Look at verse 4. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And then the angel answers uh, Zechariah, and this is in verses 5 and 7. The angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Now, so far, we've kind of had fun with this. I've said, hey, are you wondering about that? So Zechariah, and then we read Zechariah ask, and then we read the angel answer. Here we did all of that, but when the angel answers, he doesn't really answer, does he? I mean, he does answer, but he doesn't, he doesn't explain the lampstand, the lamp, the oil yet. And, and it's, not, it's not really so much that he's rebuking Zechariah. He's like us. If there was a vision like this that God uh, gave to us, we would would be asking what Zechariah is asking. Like, okay, I want to get it right. This has to do with you. Can you explain this to me? So it's not so much that the angel is rebuking Zechariah. Uh, The way this reads is the angel is heightening the tension. There There is going to be an answer, and it's going to be a very important answer, but uh, he wants to go someplace first before giving the answer. It's kind of like if you were, if you were telling a friend uh, a great story and, and the friend was like really getting into it and the friend was like, like tried to jump to the conclusion, like, well, this happened then, right? And you're like, uh, actually, wait, I'll, I'll get to that, but let me continue. And you're doing that to heighten the tension, right? There are things that you want to say before you give the answer. And that's, that's really what happens here uh, with the angel. And he, he tells uh, Zechariah that, that this, this is actually addressed to uh, Zerubbabel. So this is the second real historical figure that's shown up in these visions, the first being Joshua. And Joshua is the high priest at the time. Uh, Zerubbabel is actually the governor of the people at this time. And he's from the royal line of David. But he's the governor. He's the one that God tasked with Uh, getting the people together and rebuilding the temple, finishing the work of rebuilding the temple. And remember the moment, like uh, if you were here for this, we've talked quite a bit about where the people are uh, in this moment, like in their psychology, in their theology, right? How they're thinking about God. When the temple was being rebuilt, they were released from Babylon to go back to the land, uh, Jerusalem and Judah. And when the temple started to be rebuilt, they had the foundation down. One of the prophets, Ezra, said that the young rejoiced and the old wept. Now, it's not hard to understand why the young would rejoice. All they'd known is slavery in Babylon. And so, hey, we're finally going back to Jerusalem. We've heard about Jerusalem. And so there was some sense in which they had more optimism. But the old, these are the ones, this is referring to the ones that actually knew of Solomon's temple. They knew the glory of Solomon's temple. No building like that on earth. And so they're looking at the beginning of the work of the rebuilding of the temple, and it looks like an abandoned parking lot compared to what they know Solomon's temple looked like. And and, and it just seemed so small. This is why I started the way I did this morning, is is the idea is that these, these older people that knew about Solomon's temple, knew how God worked, right? Like through Moses, through David, through Elijah, 
They, they think they know about God. They know what ought to be in front of their eyes if God is really there. Like if he's in this. If this is a work of God, it's not going to look like this old parking lot. It's not going to seem so small, so discouraging. You know, it's going to, it's going to be of God. It's going to be more obvious. And so their, their depression of sorts comes from the fact that everything just seems, it just seems small. It, it's not... It can't be of God. God can't be with us. And of course, we know that's part of their struggle is they think God's abandoned them, that He's favoring the other nations. He's giving the blessing that He promised to Israel to all of the enemies of Israel that, that were a part of their captivity. Uh, they believed that if God was in it, they'd see exceptional things happening. And I think exceptional things, I think they were thinking through people. Because the history of their scriptures up to that point were filled with, you know, people like Abraham, uh, David, uh, you know, Joseph, uh, Moses, Elijah, all these amazing people. And they're looking at the fact that, that nothing amazing is happening through people, and it just all feels so small. This is why God gives them verse 6. Uh, look at that again with me. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. These people are, are, are like us. I, we do this, uh, I think, together. Every time we study the scriptures, we're constantly thinking, how am I like these people? Or how are these people like me? And this one seemed very obvious to me this, this week. When things get really hard, you know, so that we're up against, uh, we're up against a, a project uh, or a season of work that, that honestly, when we look at it, we're like, yeah, I don't know how this is going to happen. Like, this is, <laughs> I can do the math, and I can, you know, I'm looking, a lot of times what we do is, is we do math, right? Uh, so we'll look, we'll look and we'll say, okay, this is what I got to bring to the table, and we'll look and we'll see, okay, okay, they're, they're next to me, they're on the team, this is what they have to bring to the table. And so there's some addition, we look around, we look left and right, there is subtraction, you know, because I look at myself, I'm like, I'm really limited, there's a bunch of things I got to take off the table. And I look at the people next to me at times and I'm like, ah, there's some subtraction I need to do there too. Uh, and then we know that, that we as humans, right, we a lot of times we don't know what we don't know, but there's a lot we don't know. That's all subtraction. Sometimes we don't get along. Uh, we don't work to, together well uh, as a community or as a team. There's just a lot of subtraction. But I think we, get, we, we face a huge task, right? Like a, a huge project. And it could be, you know, it could be through our work. It could be uh, relational stuff. And, and I think we just kind of look left and right. We look horizontal. We kind of add things up, subtract, subtract things. And, uh, and a lot of times we just hang our heads, throw up our hands. Like what's on paper here just it seems so small. Take the building situation we're in. I, I want to call it a building project, okay, like the build it project that we're in. Uh, as Mark said last week, the downtown building is under contract. And so we moved all of our offices. And I did this, but I should have done this. We moved all of our offices. You know me, directionally challenged. Um, all our ministries. We moved it all yesterday from there to here. And, and by the way, if you were a part of... Raise your hand if you carried book boxes yesterday. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. <laughs> Rewards in heaven is all I got to say to you people. Um, so we moved our office uh, and our ministries here and, uh, and into a facility that uh, is 18% smaller than the downtown facility. And when we started this project, we were about 25% uh, smaller than we are today. So we did, we did that yesterday, and I say we, but... You know, you did that yesterday, a group of about 30. And so we're kind of at a place where we got to do it now. 
right? We got to do it now. Um, I don't know. Our fifth grade girls are like the kindest people in this congregation, but I don't know how long they're going to let me keep my, my desk in my office back in their Sunday school classroom. That's their classroom. So, well, we got to do it. We got to do it now. But talk about a lot of work. Talk about big numbers. Every number. Every number is big. Uh, square footage is big. The cost, the dollars is going to be big. I don't know that we know that you know, number. Uh, the number of people that are involved, will need to be involved, is going to be a big number. These are all big numbers. And every one of us is busy. Right? And then when you talk about big numbers, you know, financially, uh, we're possibly, likely, heading into a recession. Uh, I know that everybody debates whether it's a hard landing or a soft landing, but the wheels are going to crash down on the runway, and it's going to be a tough year this year for many of us financially. And that's just the way it is. And, and then you look at, at the work of, because part of the work, right, is is thinking about how do we keep 600 to 700 people absolutely in love with each other, unified, feeling important, feeling invited in, feeling agreement on everything. Wow. And, and you know, if, if the leadership, if, 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 if we did that, if we looked left and right and we added things up and we looked at, oh, these are, this is on the building committee, right? This is the guys on the building committee, the women on the building committee, a uh, little subtraction to do there. This is the pastoral team. A little bit more subtraction to do there, right? You know, and this is our resources, right? This is, what, this is what was pledged the first round, and this is maybe our debt capacity, and add these numbers up, and they're way off from what this is going to cost. And, and you can do all of that, and, and then you can... The temptation is you'll feel discouraged, You'll hang your head, you'll throw your hands up and, and say, man, just on paper here, this just, whew. If this is going to take the best of humanity, I hope we're all having a good day for like the next 365 days because... So, the equation, this is why I say we're like them, right? Like big projects, big tasks, big, big things out there. The equation, if what we're looking at is simply the human equation, the best that humanity collectively can do together, it is very, very small. It's a small day. It's a, it's a, it's a small set of resources. It, it feels very small. And it can make us wonder, is God in this? He's in this. He was in this with Israel. He's in this place with us. Now, hear me very clearly. That doesn't mean that what we think ought to happen or might happen will happen, right? Like, uh, you read it in this story. They were absolutely surprised, and some of them in a depressed way, over, over what God himself with them did in those days. So I'm not, I'm not claiming to know what God will do or won't do or what this will look like. But the question of, is God with us? Was God with them? That question's absolutely black and white, answerable from the Scriptures. Yes, God is with us. God is with us. He's in it. He was in it with this group of exiles who returned to the land. And to them, it felt too small, too many obstacles, too many hurdles. Too many impossibilities, which is why God says what he does next in uh, verses 7 through 9. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house his hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. The mountain in verse 7, there's debate on what that is. 
but not a lot of debate. That seems fairly clear. Uh, it is symbolic to these people of all the obstacles that they face. And, and the prophets have listed those out, right? Like the crops aren't producing. The money bags have holes in it. There's people in the land that are objecting to the project and are working against them. They feel abandoned. It's not as beautiful as Solomon's temple. I mean, they have a mountain of obstacles before them that when they're hearing the command of God to move forward by faith with courage, they just see the mountain. And so the mountain is the obstacles, and you really do, you can't build on a mountain. The mountain's got to be flattened, right? Like you have to have a flat foundation to build uh, is the idea here. And the statement that God is making is that the mountain will be flattened by the power of God alone through the Spirit of God. The human equation can't look at that to flatten the mountain. You've got to look to the Lord. Uh, he alone has the power to remove all obstacles, level the ground, and then build what he wants to build. When it says, uh, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it, I think, I, I believe, this is my best study, that that is God shouting grace, grace to it, as the top stone is being placed. Now, this is, this is a top stone. It's not the foundational cornerstone. I mean, there is a foundational cornerstone, and it's, the, it's usually the first stone that sets the whole project uh, in place, its measurements, everything depends on that being placed correctly. But the top stone, oftentimes we'll call it a capstone, that's the last stone you place. And that is the stone that, it's a real thing, but it absolutely signifies that everything that God had promised to do, all the work that God promised that he would accomplish, when, when that measuring tape for that last stone is in Zerubbabel's hands and that last stone is set down into its place, everybody's going to know that what God said through these prophets was absolutely true. And, and even if they don't see it as true when it was said, right? Even if, even if as the word of God is being spoke uh, to them, as the vision is being cast, they're discouraged because everything seems small. So, so verse 10 is, is truly God speaking to the discouraged people of this day, saying, there's going to be a day you're going to rejoice. What you're discouraged about, it's going to be gone. Uh, look at verse 10 again. I love this verse. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. For whoever has despised the day of small things. Isn't that a great phrase? I take a lot of encouragement, I really do, uh, from the people in the Scriptures, the Old Testament uh, characters, the, the New Testament characters, like the disciples, uh, even these people in our text, because they were constantly needing God to redefine what is actually big and what is actually small. What is actually of God and, and what, is, what is actually, uh, you know, as they would think, well, that's too small and not dynamic enough. It can't be of God. And it's like over and over throughout all of the scriptures, God is having to step in and say, no, your measurements and your thinking are completely wrong. Like you think about the disciples with Jesus. They got to live with God for three years. And, and you think about how they leaned, right? Big proved God's work. Like the bigger the crowd, uh, man, Jesus, look, we got these huge crowds following us. Jesus is like, yeah, we're going to go on. We're going to leave them. Wait, this is what we do, right? This is what people in the world do. We want a big crowd. You got it. Why would you leave? 
You know, the, the titles that people carried were big. So that when Jesus stopped to, to talk with a Samaritan woman on her fifth marriage, that was too small of a person. Jesus, come on, we got to go. Right? A paralytic? And, and Jesus is constantly telling the disciples, no, big does not prove that God is in it. Like, your ideas of how the kingdom of God on earth will prove itself are not just off, they're completely backwards. They're, they're wrong. And I like that because, again, I'm going I'm to linger on this. We are so that way at times. We do not like the day of small things. If we're in the day of small things, we will do numerous things to try to make it feel like a big day. Just as I've been a pastor for about 22 years, and I have seen over and over again people hop from one church to the next, hoping to see something happen, something big happen through them in the next body so that they can feel like, okay, God is real, and He does love me, and He is accomplishing big, powerful things through me. And then when it doesn't necessarily happen in the next place, they'll go to the next place. By the way, pastors are not immune from that. Uh, I, I've seen a number of pastors um, conclude the day is a small day in a small place, and these are small people. And, and so, man, we've got to spice things up. We've got to grow this thing, right, and, and try some, some gimmicky things, uh, some fancy techniques to ministry, uh, turn the worship team into a rock band, because everybody likes rock concerts. Or sometimes when, when that stuff doesn't work, you'll see pastors hop churches quite a bit. And usually the hope is, i got to find something bigger. i got to find something more dynamic that, that will show me God's in this more. But this, it's everybody's issue. We, we all struggle with this. Many fight the day of small things by seeking important roles or, you know, bigger titles or greater incomes or, you know, more respect, more influence in a community. Many try to muster up, you know, what they view as kind of the most dynamic spiritual gifts or spiritual experiences because they hope that will prove that, that God is at work in them and through them. I think it's, I think it's at the root of why, uh, and this isn't new to our day, this was in Paul's day, but why we tend to like to follow rock star national pastors and preachers and, and personalities I think when our life starts to feel small, we think, oh man, I'm following somebody with a big, powerful ministry, right? A big personality. And, and, and somehow we think that's going to make us feel bigger. God is more at work. And yeah, we don't like, we don't like small things. We don't like uh, small days, small people. Uh, we have a really hard time seeing God in that. We think God's work is proved by the big things. Just if I could summarize what this vision is saying, it is precisely showing the falsity of that idea. Uh, God is with these people. His, his presence is with them. It is amongst them. His work is being accomplished uh, in powerful ways that are seeming small to this group. And that's what verses 10 through 14, we'll pick up uh, in the middle of verse 10 through 14, are showing us. These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. Then I said to him, what are these olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? And a second time, I answered and said to him, And what are these two branches of the olive trees, which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out? He said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my Lord. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. 
I'm going to summarize an overwhelming amount of study in the minutia really quickly in several little statements, and you may disagree and come up to me. I love to, to banter and talk about these things, but to run quickly through what I see as Zechariah's explanation here. Uh, clearly, the seven eyes uh, of the Lord are stressing the omniscience and the omnipotence of God. That shows up in other places in the scriptures. And it's, it's stressing the fact that our God sees and knows everything that happens on the face of the earth, and he is all-powerful and sovereign over all of it. So that's that statement. The lamp, like the lamp stand and the lamp, that is God's presence and his power amongst his people. So that's, that's the lamp stand and the lamp. And the two olive trees... Uh, beside the lamp are, are really, like, I almost put a picture up, but I disagreed with some of the pictures, but like, okay, so picture a golden lamp stand. Here's the flat part. On it is the lamp. And then I almost picture like the bowl on top of that. And there's, there's the word for tree is actually twig, so these are small. But the idea is that there's two olive trees that are growing up and they are directly feeding into the bowl. And so the picture here of the, the two olive trees is that if the lamp in the stand, right, are, are the presence of God, the power of God, the light of God in the world, then the, the fact that these two trees have grown up and are supplying the bowl, that whole thing says it'll never end. You know, you ever light a candle and a breeze blows through or the candle burns out and all of a sudden, oh, I guess I'm done with that candle. That'll never end. This, this light will never end because it has two uh, olive trees that are perpetually, eternally feeding the, the bowl that feeds the lamp. So this whole picture symbolizes how the power of God, the presence of God, the, the light of God uh, in the world with his people is something that will never, ever end. And it's there whether it feels small to us or not, but it's always there and it'll absolutely never end. But how? This is fascinating. Not what I'm going to say, but what the Scripture says. Uh, how? How does the power and the presence and the work and the light of God come to his people, stay with his people, always be with his people? How in the world does that happen? From the text, the answer is by the Spirit of God through the Word of God. By the Spirit of God through the Word of God. The, the Spirit of God, we've already read, that shows up in verse 6. It says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, but the word of the Lord, that shows up through these two twigs, these two olive trees. Uh, there's debate on who these two people are. I feel strongly on this too, or I wouldn't preach it. I think in this moment, these are referring to Haggai and Zechariah. And I'll give, you, I'll give you my reasons for that because I think this is really important. In verse 3, it specifically says that these two trees stand beside the Lord of all the earth. Not before Him, but beside Him. Remember, Joshua was before the Lord in the previous vision. They stand beside him. Now, again, this is still kind of courtroom, throne room vision. And so what it's really saying is that these two trees have access to the, the courtroom of God, the heavenly scene, the heavenly courtroom. That's why I don't think that it's Joshua or Zerubbabel, uh, because they don't actually have access to that that heavenly courtroom um, but these prophets do or they couldn't give us the prophecy they're in the courtroom they're being 
shown the courtroom. And they're being shown the courtroom because the picture is almost like they're beside God in what God is doing, and they're emissaries, they're servants, they're ambassadors, they're ready to play whatever role God has, but they're beside God in this, this courtroom. The other reason I think that this is Haggai and Zechariah is that it is so consistent with the idea that the power to accomplish what God wants to accomplish is through the Spirit and through the Word alone. They're the twigs, right? The branches. They're not the oil. In fact, the word for oil here is is the Hebrew word yahir, and it means new oil. And, And that's perfectly in line. If this is Haggai and it's Zechariah, then the new oil is clearly referring to the prophetic words of God that are given by His grace uh, alone, are given to His people, are given to the world uh, through the prophets, through the, the, the authors of our, our, our holy scriptures. So the lampstand and the lamp represent the power and the presence and the light the supply, right, of God to his people. And the two lampstands then symbolize, uh, or yeah, the, the two trees symbolize that this will never end because it is given to us through the word of God, which is fallen people. We can only receive, right, hear, know, trust by the spirit of God. And I say that's consistent because, again, God's laying out huge designs and plans, some of which are fulfilled short-term. Most of this is pointing ahead to the work of Christ and the new heavens and the new earth. And this is all, you talk about like the idea of, of adding to this facility. This building plan that God has to build the temple for all eternity, redeem people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language to himself for all time, Uh, No human equation is going to get to that. It will be accomplished only by the power of God, by the word of God, through the spirit of God. So Zerubbabel is important, Joshua is important. It's not their power that's going to finish this project. It's the word of God. But even the word of God can seem small to God's people. small enough to miss, small enough to not like. The the people that that God spoke to through Zechariah eventually concluded, uh, we don't like that. Uh, We don't see that as true. That doesn't feel like our God. Uh, We don't like what what you're saying. We don't like uh, the role you're playing. And so they killed him. They killed Zechariah. We don't have much on that, but Jesus uh, comes back and he makes one, he makes a statement in uh, Matthew 23, uh, starting in verse 34. He says, therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify from the blood of innocent Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. So at some point, this generation heard the words of God through Zechariah, concluded, uh, yeah, we don't like them. Uh, They clearly are not of God, and so they killed Zechariah. And in the word of God, it's just the the truth of it, it is still uh, easy to miss for many today. It, it still today feels uh, small, uh, like God isn't in it. Isn't that ironic that the Word of God can feel to us like God isn't in it? But it still does today. Uh, it still feels small. Uh, like when the Word of God, and when I say the Word of God, I mean the Word of God, the one that was in the beginning, created all things, is God And then the word of God that uh, at the beginning of the gospel says uh, in love for us actually came and took on flesh and became one of us. 
that word of God, talk about a small day. A small moment, right? A small person, a small place. Uh, what's smaller than a fertilized human embryo? It's four times smaller than a mustard seed. And to an unmarried woman from a nowhere town, that's pretty small stuff. And we might think, well, okay, but that's the Word of God. And yeah, he took on flesh and, and was born to Mary and Joseph, and that's amazing, but, but he grew up into a man, right? He grew up and, and uh, you know, he, he lived a, a perfectly righteous life, and he spoke the words of God, and he no doubt carried himself well. I mean, surely then it was obvious, right? It was big. It was obvious that God's in this, God's in this man, God speaks through this man, this is what God is doing. Surely it was obvious, because it was big at that point. Here in three weeks, we're going to, uh, not just we, but pretty much every Christian in America, uh, will celebrate Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday is a very interesting day. That's the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, right? The king returns to his city, rides in on a donkey, and talk about expectations of a big day. That's Palm Sunday. They're waving these palm branches saying, Hosanna, right? Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They were waiting in that moment for Jesus to get off the donkey, kick Rome in the rear, Restore everything to the glories of David and Solomon's day. Wait a second. He's, he's arrested? No, he, he's, he's brought up on charges before the Jewish leaders? He's convicted on those charges? He's handed over to Rome? Like the, the Jewish leaders gave him into the authority of Rome? They have another, like, false charge, like, court. He's convicted. He's condemned. He's crucified on a tree, which, according to both Roman custom and uh, Israel custom, is proof that he's a cursed man. The same crowds uh, that were chanting Hosea, by the end of the Gospels, are chanting crucify crucify, crucify, get rid of this man. He, that can't be God. It's too bloody. It's too messy. It's too human, too small. What's powerful about that? Well, we're going to celebrate together what was powerful about that. What was powerful about that was that through the life and the death of and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, the mountain that every one of us shares in common. It's the greatest obstacle of our, of our life, in our life, between us actually dwelling with God. Now and for all time, the biggest mountain in our life is our sin. It's the, it's the righteous, holy judgment of our sin that we have earned for ourselves, and it is the the resulting wrath of God towards sin, our death, that's our mountain. That's my biggest mountain, is my sin before a holy God. And it was through the life and the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus that the power of God, through the word of God, leveled that mountain so that God could build on it. So that anyone in here, if you get to a place where you humble yourself before the Lord and you stop looking to your life and your accomplishments to try to make you right with God, but you look to the person and the work of Jesus, the leveler of the mountain, your faith in Jesus, God says, I make you a stone in my house that I'm building. Now, the foundation of that, we said 
capstone earlier, but Jesus is both the foundational stone and the capstone. Uh, the Apostle Paul would write, this is 1 Corinthians 3, uh, verse 11, he says, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. So the only way that we become a part of the house of God, right, the household of God, is through the finished work of Jesus. He's the foundation. There's no other way to be a part of the family of God. The great capstone moment, I believe, I I personally think it's best described in Revelation chapter 5. Amazing passage, uh, the one to read this week, amazing, uh, Revelation chapter 5, it's when Christ alone is shown to be worthy. No one else in creation is worthy to take the scroll and open it, to break its seals and open it, which is signaling the perfect, final, once and for all, glorious fulfillment of all of God's plans, all of His purpose, through all history, Prior to creation, all the way up to this moment, all of what God intended to do is done, perfectly completed, only through the Word of God, the person of Jesus. Because He was slain and by His death purchased people from every tribe, tongue, language, and nation. So he's the, he's, the, he's the foundational stone and he's the corner, the capstone uh, of the whole work of God being accomplished. And, and here, here's the truth. Like if you're in Christ, if you've trusted Jesus, you have work to do. Like that's the point of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is that you've been given this by grace, right? This this chance to be a brick in the family of God, but now you, in your life, get to build on that. I have to build on that. Every day, every moment of every day, through my choices, am I going to be faithful to God? Am I going to trust Him? Am I going to be courageous? Am I going to be like Christ uh, by the Spirit of God? Uh, We build on that, and every man's building of their life will be examined by God But the beauties of this, the the declaration of the Lord here, uh, right? Grace, grace to it, is is that if you're in Christ because of what Christ did for you and you trust that, even if you don't live perfectly, which none of us can, that does not threaten the fact that the work will get done and you will be in the family of God for all of eternity. Because even that depends on the power of, of God through the Spirit of God by the Word of God. So, we're going to remember uh, together the, the work of Christ on our behalf. And just want to encourage you, if you haven't yet put your faith in Jesus, uh, to become a part of the family of God, looked at Him and what He did Uh, to accomplish your salvation, to die for your sins that you could receive his righteousness. Uh, Again, this morning, I invite you to do that. There's no other foundation to build upon if you hope to be actually in the family, the household of God than Christ. And again, for for the rest of us, uh, whether whether you uh, attend this church regularly or not, Uh, If you've trusted in the person and work of Jesus for salvation, his blood, uh, then we invite you to remember uh, his body and his blood with us as we take communion. So let me pray for us, and then I'll ask our servers to come forward. Father, this is just, this is too great for our limited minds to fully take in, but what we are able to take in just makes us want to worship you, makes us want to just fall down and and thank you for the grace and the mercy that you have given to us through the word of God. And Father, thank you for the word of God through 
Haggai, Zechariah, all the prophets, all the authors of Scripture, thank you that we can go to your word by your spirit and enjoy your presence. And Jesus, now as we move to this uh, ordinance, this sacrament that you have given to us, help us to focus our minds on how you lived your life in the body in perfect righteousness and holiness, uh, even unto offering your body up to die. And help us to focus on your shed blood, your very life that was given that we might have forgiveness of sins. And we worship you and we pray in, in your name, Jesus. Amen.